Well, hello and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this teleseminar. Uh, we're getting started a little bit late here, but uh, thank you for joining this teleseminar on decolonizing resiliency movements uh, with Susan Juniper Park. Uh, my name is Don Hall, and I will be the host for today's call. Uh, before we jump into it, however, I'd like to make a few quick announcements. Uh, first of all, this call is sponsored by Transition US. Uh, for those who might not already be familiar with us, uh, we are the national hub for the international transition movement, which is building local resilience and self-reliance from the bottom up in thousands of communities all over the world. You can learn more about us, find a transition initiative near you, sign up for our newsletter, and donate to support programs like this one at transitionus.org. Uh, Next, I want to tell you about a few other upcoming events that you might be interested in. Uh, one is a part two of this teleseminar today uh, with Susan Park on creating inclusive and diverse communities. Uh, it will be starting at the same time at 4 p.m. Pacific on Thursday, November 2nd. Uh, and we have one more uh, teleseminar coming up uh, next month, and that will be on uh, Being the Change, Live Well and Spark a Climate Revolution uh, with Dr. Peter Kalmus. And this, uh, both of these teleseminars uh, you can find on our website, transitionus.org. You can register for free there. Uh, finally, I'll tell you a little bit about how this call is going to go. Uh, the running time for this teleseminar will be about 75 minutes, uh, beginning with some remarks by our presenter, followed by Q&A. Uh, this call is being recorded and will be posted to our website in about two weeks' time. Uh, to preserve sound quality, everyone is currently muted, but you can press 1 on your keypad at any time to raise your hand and ask a question. Uh, and when you do speak, uh, please say your name and also where you're from to give us a little bit of a sense of uh, where everybody's calling in from today. Uh, Susan has also provided a PDF outline of this talk. Uh, so hopefully you received that earlier today. If you haven't, you can again go to transitionus.org. Uh, on the main page, under online events, you'll see decolonizing resiliency movements. Just click on that, and there'll be a link there outlined for decolonizing resiliency movements. You click on that, and it will automatically download. Uh, if you haven't received it, and you uh, aren't near a computer at the moment, don't worry. Uh, that's fine. Uh, Susan's talk will still make sense, and you can download the outline later and refer back to it uh, to remember what we talked about here today. Uh, so without further ado, um, today's presentation, again, going to be on decolonizing resiliency movements with Susan Juniper Park. And Susan is an activist working at the cross-section of ecological, economic, and social justice. She is also involved in urban farming, healing, education, and permaculture. She's a co-founding member of the Economic Development Without Displacement Coalition, an Oakland-based anti-gentrification project. She ran a food justice economic project at Fat Beats Produce. Oakland-based grassroots food justice organization, worked as a fundraiser for the Ruckus Society, a direct action training organization empowering frontline communities, and was an organizer with Occupy the Farm, a Bay Area land defense effort that you might be familiar with. These days you can find your substitute teaching in Oakland K-12 schools, doing gardening digs, facilitating workshops, and cultivating a healing justice practice. 
She is grateful and humbled to be an immigrant and permanent guest living on beautiful Ohlone. You'll have to correct me on the pronunciation there, Susan. Ohlone territory. So I'll turn it over to you now, Susan. Great. Thank you so much, Don, for hosting this. Thank you for to Transition US, and thank you all for being here. And for um, yeah, trusting your next 75 minutes to me. Um, I think um, what I want to do is I would like for folks, or I would invite folks to maybe close your eyes right now and think about the land that you're on. Hopefully the land you're on right now is a place you call home or where you live. If it's not, you can think about both places, the, place you're, the land you're on right now and a place that you call home. And think about who has stewarded that piece of land for millennia, for the last, I don't know, 10,000 years. And you may know those people, who those people are or not. So let's just take a second to give thanks to them for having walked on that piece of land before us and for having put in their sweat, tear, energy, love to tending the land and this piece of Mother Earth that we love so much and for allowing this place to come alive so that we can be here today. And now think about those people. Again, you may know who they are or not. And know that their children, their progeny still exist today. They may not be on the same piece of land. They may have been displaced. But these people are still very much alive. And they have struggles. In particular, they have struggles to regain back their ancestral homelands and to retain their culture and their sovereignty. Feel into their struggles for a second. And then come on back to our teleseminar space. And um, so I've never given a teleseminar before, so it's, this is a little bit of a, um, a tricky, tricky um, experience for me because I can't see you all. I can't read your faces. I can't read your, um, your, your gestures, um, whether you have questions, your expressions. So I guess what we're going to do is we're going to play around with the pads on your key. Um, so maybe one thing I should just check is everyone who is listening on this call right now, just press 1. And then Don will feed back to me how many people have pressed that number. Just want to make sure people okay. are out there. It's coming along. We got uh, 41 hands up. <coughs> maybe, oh, great. maybe a few people dozing out there, but uh, yeah, seems like everybody's hearing you. Okay, great. And how many people are on the call right now, Don? Who uh, maybe have pressed? Okay, great. Um, next order of business is I want to apologize for the way I sound. I'm getting over a cold and it's being exasperated as many of you know in you know, North, North California right now we're experiencing um, one of the most seriously devastating fires ever and it's affecting all of the Bay Area in terms of our air quality today where I live in Oakland, California. Even though we're not experiencing fire, our air quality is in the red and the hazardous zone so and it's been um, making my cold worse, so I, I, I don't sound very good, and I really apologize for that. At any point during our call, um, if you cannot hear me, or if I need to slow down, or to um, pronounce my words more clearly, please go ahead and press 2 at any time if you need me to do that. Don will let me know, and that will give me um, a, a, you know, a, be a good reminder for me to slow down my words, or to maybe pronounce things better. Um, if at any time during this conversation, and I'm going to be doing a little bit more of a, a teaching thing today, but, and then we will save about the last 15 minutes for a Q&A, but um, I also want this to be interactive. So if any, at any point 
during what I am presenting, you have a question or a comment, feel free to press 1. That signals to me that you are raising your hand. And I may not, if it's not at a good juncture, I may not call on you, but feel free to please press 1 if you have something to say. So without further ado, um, oh, the other thing I would like, love to know is um, if you are not calling today from either the place we call the United States or the place we call Canada, will you please press 1? Okay, we have two hands up so far, calling from outside of North America. Okay, um, Don, is there a way they can type or can they? Uh, no, this is just audio only. Okay. Um, well, I'd like to know where they're from, so can we just quickly ask them? Okay. Just, yeah. just uh, one where word, where you're from. I'll call on you one at a time, and I'll turn your mic on. So we have uh, Aaron Malone. Where are you calling from, Erin? Oh, I misunderstood. I'm calling from Canada. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Great. And then the other person? Uh, we actually have three <laughs> now. Uh, we have Nancy, and I'm going to butcher your last name, Caicedo. Nancy, we can hear you now. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, where are you from? from? Massachusetts, Boston, actually outside of Boston. Okay, you're still within the place we called U.S. and Canada, so we're all good. Um, so the next question uh, I have... One next more, question. maybe. Oh, okay. Uh, Blake Poland, Let's see if we got one from outside the... Yeah, I'm in Canada as well. Oh, okay. okay, great. So yeah, the Thanks, question Blake. was, if you are calling from outside of the place we call the United States or Canada, then raise your hand. So it looks like everybody's within that, those regions. Um, I, I say this because I'm premising our conversation in those two areas because colonization looks very different depending on where you are, obviously. And you know, who um, someone is being displaced is obviously going to be very different depending on where we are. So I just wanted to check that. Um, and just one last thing I want to check before I get into the, my presentation is if you identify as being someone indigenous to the place we call United States or Canada or to Turtle Island, but I'm just not including Mexico right now, if you are indigenous to those places, then please go ahead and press 3. Still no hands up if you consider yourself indigenous to the United States or Canada. Please press 3 on your keypad. <laughs> okay, I don't think we, got, okay. we have anybody. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, I just always want to make sure and check that. Um, so um, what brings us here today, I've been doing these conversations about decolonizing resiliency movements. In particular, I kind of am part of uh, the permaculture community here in Northern California. Um, but I feel like there's a huge overlap between transition and permaculture, not just in terms of ideas and you know, the kinds of future, the kind of vision both have and the kinds of technology both uses, but also in terms of um, people who are involved in those two communities tend to overlap a lot. So I feel like um, my talk is going to be a little bit more geared towards the permaculture community, but I feel like it very much overlaps into transition. And later on, I will ask more specifically, because I'm not involved in transition towns, I will ask more specifically later if there are folks here representing transition who maybe have you know, a little more nuanced things to add to this conversation. But for now, it's going to be a little bit geared towards permaculture, because that's the community I come from. And um, that's the definition of resiliency that I'm bringing. 
So we're going to be talking about decolonizing resiliency movements specifically. So for me, I'm thinking those mean things like transition, permaculture, reskilling movement, etc. Um, I know that there are other communities and other um, kinds of sectors that use that word resiliency, but I'm not familiar with those definitions, so that is not what we're going to be talking about today. And we are going to be, again, premising our talk in the area, the, the uh, northern parts of Turtle Island, the areas that um, in the colonizing world we've come to call United States and Canada. Um, so what is colonization? If you look, if for folks who are following along on their um, on their, um, the, the guideline that I sent, um, you can actually read along. These are kind of the, the when I Googled colonization, this was the first definition that popped up, and it's a pretty good definition. Colonization is the action or process of settling among and establishing control over the indigenous people of an area. Right? Colonization means someone else foreign to that land came and um, exerted control over it, usually through violence. And then um, in, in you know, what, again, what we call um, Turtle Island or North America, we have a particular brand of uh, colonization here, and people, folks call it settler colonialism. And again, this is the first definition that pops up when you Google settler colonialism. And it's a distinct type of colonialism that functions through the replacement of indigenous populations with an invasive settler society that, over time, develops a distinctive identity and sovereignty. So that would be the government or the countries, the nation states of the United States and Canada. Those did not exist. Um, those did not come a, a, about naturally, and those did not exist here prior to you know, however many 300 years or whatever it is. right? And there were a different people living here, indigenous population who um, who um, were decimated in order for those two countries to come to existence. And those two countries have the ruling class of those two countries. Um, the people who make that up are very different than the original indigenous people of these lands, right? Um, so uh, let's see if those two. If those two um, definitions make sense to you, why don't you go ahead and press 2? I just want to check. We might not get into a, a, a question about it right now, but I just want to see if those definitions make sense to people. So if it makes sense Lots to you, go ahead and press 2. Lots of hands going up. OK, great. OK, great. <laughs> um, Don, do you have a quick thirds. number? Okay, great. Um, so we can, yep. yeah, we can come back to um, having questions about it, but I will just move on to the next section, which is, if that's colonization, then what is decolonizing? And these are my definitions. The first thing, the number one thing about decolonization is undoing the harms of genocide and theft that was perpetrated on the indigenous people, the people who were colonized. Decolonizing is undoing the harms right, of colonization to the indigenous peoples. And then a second definition is applying that same undoing of the harms to other groups who are marginalized and oppressed by the very same colonial systems the original colonial systems and the original colonial systems continuing legacy. So here, again, um, I believe at least in the context of the United States, those tend to be white supremacy, patriarchy, um, our you know, economic, um, our capitalist economic system, Western thought, um, and, and related, related things. So, um, Let's see. It's so hard when I can't see people's faces. Um, maybe if anybody has a burning question or comment about that, I can take maybe one or two. So go ahead and press one if you have any burning questions or comments about what we've talked about so far or what I've said so far. OK, we got one hand going up. And OK, just let's just take the first hand. <laughs> Uh, we have K 
Kathleen. Right. Kathleen, your um, line's open. The uh, decolonizing, it seems to me, is, is, uh, it's a process, and the process uh, applies to both the indigenous and the settlers, the colonizers. And so uncovering or what we're doing today, learning about, isn't that the beginning of the process of decolonizing? Sure, it's definitely part of the process of decolonizing, educating yourself around it, or even making spaces where we're you know, talking about it, right? So that things are kind of like coming to the forefront, of course. Yeah, definitely agree that it's a process. And hopefully what we're doing here is contributing to it. Thanks. Uh, do you want to take one more, Susan? Yeah, there's another question. I can take one. <laughs> okay. uh, let me just find it in the list here. Uh, Andrew Langford. Yes, hello, that's live. Okay, yeah, Andrew Langford here from Brooks in California. Uh, so I'm sorry? I, I, I'm, in, I'm from Brooks in California. Okay. Yeah, Pat, Win, Pat Winland. Um, I was interested to know if you've got any, you know, where would you go to look for case studies where people have done really good work in, on this, in this form? You know, um, maybe that can be a follow-up with some... Yeah, that could be a follow-up with some resources that I can send out later. So okay, great. Yeah, kind, okay. kind of beyond the scope of what I'm talking about. Okay, so maybe um, maybe let's just let that simmer, and then I will I'll just move on. Um, so the n next section really is like you know we can think about like what is the problem with um, colonization or as or like continuing legacy of colonization and how it shows up in uh, movements of resiliency. And specifically, again, because I'm kind of coming from the permaculture community, I've been thinking a lot about like problems with permaculture and how it replicates systems of um, colonization, right? So um, maybe I should actually just take a poll right now. Um, how many folks are either considered themselves part of permaculture community or are familiar with permaculture? You can go ahead and press one. Okay, so we have uh, still some hands going up, but uh, a little bit over half the group, 54%. Okay, great. Um, so I'll just give a little definition of permaculture. Permaculture is a design lens that um, looks at, looks to create solutions using patterns that are observed in nature, right? And where it's used to the most is things like, you know, um, and the problems it's trying to solve are problems of future human settlement. Permaculture is supposed to be a shortening of permanent culture, permanent human settlements that are more regenerative, more resilient, more sustainable. And it tends to look like, um, you know, a lot of things that are doing um, agriculture, like sustainable agriculture, that's closed loop system, you know, creating other aspects of human um, settlement needs like energy, water, how to like capture water, capture energy, store water, clean water. Um, and then there's aspects of permaculture that deal with a society in general, like social permaculture and like how do we, you know, create healthier relationships with each other using sort of the, the lens of permaculture and mimicking patterns found in nature. So, um, so this thing, permaculture, uh, came about because two um, white men in Australia observed the many indigenous technologies, knowledge, and ways of doing things, and they uh, kind of condensed it together to create this like design lens. And it's the design lens also is very pretty complicated and has a lot of um, sets of principles that are pretty ingenious, actually. But um, but these two men basically observed things that were already in existence, and they kind of like you know brought them together, right? To um, to um, to to brand it as permaculture, basically. So that's the premise of it. Um, 
and they often call it the cutting edge of a 10,000 year technology. And the thing that's like very ingenious about permaculture and in that world, and I feel like um, a lot of other resilient movements are basically also utilizing the same things. Everybody's sort of trying to, you know, go back to traditional old ways of being and doing things that are more in connection with the earth, with the rhythms of the earth, revering earth and each other, coming together more together um, as a community, as a village again, as opposed to sort of like these like separated individual, you know, capitalist lives that we've been leading for the last few hundred years. So kind of like the permaculture is spaces of that. And there's a saying in permaculture that says it's the cutting edge of a 10,000 year technology because of this, this idea of the great return. We are all returning back to our sort of like more indigenous, more ancestral, more traditional ways of, you know, living and working with the earth. Um, but the problem with it is, with a statement like that is um, it doesn't talk about whose technology this 10,000 year old technology is and who originally tended this knowledge, which are observed. They, they have admitted that they've observed it from various indigenous folks. They never quite credit who they observed it from, where it comes from. They just kind of call it like indigenous technology. And there's not really like a proper credit being given back to who attended this knowledge in the first place, who um, brought it about, you know, with, and practiced it with blood, sweat, and tears, and brought it, you know, brought it forward so that, like, the next generation can continue forward. Um, another, <laughs> another problem is that these technologies are often in permaculture sort of like, um, they're kind of like, you know, um, pulled and put together as, you know, at will as a, as a designer sees fit for a site or a project or whatever it is. So they pull aspects from many different cultural contexts, and it's removed from those particular cultural contexts. It's just like an aspect of it is picked, plucked out. What they consider is like the, the technology aspect of it is plucked out and then used without the cultural context and, again, used without um, any kind of uh, recognition or, or, you know, or gratitude. Um, I think the biggest problem with permaculture that I've seen is that it is this thing that is branded and commodified. It's um, these ways of working that people have been working with the earth. It was never meant to be, you know, I mean, like people hadn't been using using it to, to commodify it, to, to turn it into courses that, you know, can earn income for the people who are teaching it, you know. It wasn't meant to be, um, to be a business model that folks can then, you know, plug into a capitalist model of having customers, clients, making profit, all of that thing. Um, and then to think about that and then seeing like, well, you know, and then who profits off of this like 10,000 year old indigenous technologies that, you know, various indigenous folks tend to, and who gets to profit off of it now is not the original, usually not the original people who brought this knowledge about. Uh, another problem is there is not a proper recognition or reciprocity or reparations. There's not recognitions usually kind of clumped together as like, oh, it was an indigenous way, it was an ancestral way, it was a traditional way, but not like, you know, really recognizing like the actual lineages these things come from. And certainly, there's not a reciprocity that's paid. It's just like comes into this general field of knowledge that folks then sort of like brand and commodify. And nothing is given back to the original, the lineages that these things come from. And certainly, no reparations are made because often um, the indigenous folks from whom these things were sort of like, you know, lifted from are having real struggles, right? Right now in modern society, real struggles of like trying to regain land back, the ancestral lands back. Um, having a lot of political and societal repression, and there's no reparations made back to them, and no recognition, no reciprocity. So there's like this uneven, you know, it's basically like you're, you're basically, I mean, to me it's theft. You're taking something and you're not giving back. Another aspect of permaculture, and I think like if people are also coming from transition, because transition is a lot more based on like community, right, community scale resilience, building community, just like permaculture, it's very much place-based. It's very much land-based. And in order for us to survive and thrive in the future, we have to understand that we come from the earth and that we are part of earth and we need to tend to earth, right? So all of it, the, 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 um, the thing that, like, you know, our resilient future needs to be place-based, right? And many people recognize that right now. 
So understanding that all this is play space, um, there's a lot of things, you know, a lot of people are trying to go back to a place, right? To, to a piece of their land that they can tend. But unfortunately, like all the participants here are not indigenous to this land. So no matter what they're doing, this is not their land to tend. And I'm not saying everybody needs to move back and no one can tend the land here. But there, you know, people are not doing the proper thing of like recognition, reci you know, reciprocity. They're not doing that before claiming this land that has been tended by other folks for millennia. And there's, I think there's just like a, a problem with that on both a social, like, you know, justice perspective and also just from like a, um, from just like even a, um, you know, an earth like energy perspective, like, you know, this land had this like relationship, deep relationship with the people who were attending it for a long time and all of a sudden that was just like severed through, through, you know, it's pretty violent methods, right? A lot of genocide, a lot of warfare. And then new folks were brought on to have this um, relationship. And I don't think that, you know, it's, it's, I think it's not a really good, um, respectful, reverential, like, cycle that's built up there. <laughs> and of course, because people want to, like, you know, their own land to tend, and they have this, like, very, you know, real desire within themselves. And back in there, like, if they, everybody traced our lineage on this call, we all had ancestral places that we came from, right? We're probably not here. We're probably not in North America. It was somewhere else. And we have lineages where our people had tended land in our ancestral homeland. So we have this, like, real burning desire to go back to that. And it's a beautiful thing, but to really think about who did we displace here, and who is not allowed to, you know, um, to to continue their connection with their ancestral land for us to be here and for us to claim that here, right? Um, and then a problem with that is then folks with a lot more privilege, especially economic privilege, buying and owning land, not just here, but in permaculture, like, you know, folks are trying to look for cheaper land they can go. So they go to other places. They go to maybe uh, Central America. They go to Southeast Asia, you know, different places because they can buy land there. But when they can buy and own land there, someone had been displaced. People who were indigenous to those lands had been displaced, right, in order to facilitate that kind of, like, um, capitalistic exchange. So really think about that. Who are you displacing for you to be on that land if it's not your ancestral place? And it's not to say don't do it, but it's to say um, make the right, you know, do it in the right way, build relationships, make, you know, uh, give reciprocity, make reparations, recognize, build relationships. Um, and then the final thing that I've noticed, and I'm sure folks in transition are also, you know, doing these things about, like, you know, homesteading, the homesteading skill, the homesteading movement, the primitive skills movement. Um, and I think the permaculture and transition world probably overlap quite a bit. And like, you know, everybody wants to can things at home, grow your own vegetables, whatever it is, you know. And it's a wonderful thing. It's um, it's it's a, a, the pre-industrial, pre and sometimes pre-modern ways of living in uh, connection with the earth and tending the earth that is really important for us to get back to. But those terms and the way that these things are practiced is problematic, um, particularly. I mean, what we each of us separately, homesteading is problematic because that term comes from the Homesteading Act from the 1800s, right? Homesteading Act was for the U.S. government to parcel off um, native land in the Plains area after they had sort of displaced and murdered um, the native people there. They parceled off those lands and gave it to European settlers. And it was a way to sort of like, you know, expand to the West and these folks were called the pioneers and they were given these pieces of land and because it was uh, pre-industrial times or I guess kind of industrial times but whatever, um, a pre, pre-modern time still, you know, those folks were like practicing um, self-sufficiency skills on those pieces of land and it was called homesteading and to use that term is to like, you know, um, to continue that kind of legacy. So I find that word problematic, not the, not the aspects of it itself. So I feel like we can be using different words like reskilling or, you know, there's various other, or earth skills. There's various other words out there that I think are not such, have um, such strong connections to these problematic things in history that have happened. Um, same thing with primitive skills. Um, there's different words I think that can happen. 
Um, primitive skills has especially kind of you know been under a lot of scrutiny. First of all, like what they're calling primitive is like for some folks, for some um, people around the world, these are like like um, traditional skills that are actually still alive. So to call something primitive, you know, to put that kind of value on it, I think is really problematic. Another thing is that the um, folks who practice the primitive, so-called primitive skills, um, tend to be largely of European descent here, at least in North America. People who practice this thing or are part of that movement. <laughs> and the uh, kinds of skills, because like you know, back in their ancestral lineage, you know, unfortunately, like Europeans had were one of the first people to have sort of like lost connection to those kinds of um, ways of living really you know in concert with the earth and nature and keeping up those kinds of um, technologies and skills. I think they tend to you know grasp onto the things that are most readily available, which means that in in this area in, in on Turtle Island, that tends to be the skills and technologies of the indigenous people here. So again, like how are you that's fine to practice those things, but how are you doing it? Are you making, you know, relationships first? Are you asking permission? Are you um, giving something in reciprocity? Are you making reparations? Those are just kind of the like questions that um, that are really important before, you know, before um, Jumping into these things that feel like, oh, I want to do that, I want to do that, I want to live more close to Earth. But like, you know, to really think about like what what's behind there, and to really think about this as like a, um, what can I call it? Let's see, um, just an interconnected web, right? We in permaculture, especially, we talk about this interconnected web, and this is an interconnected web. You can't just like pluck out little aspects of it without understanding that there's a whole whole thing that's happening within the system. <laughs> so um, let's see, why don't I stop there and see if there are any questions and comments on that section. So again, press 1 if you have a question or comment. I feel like I'm talking a lot and I'm talking in this space. Well, this is great. Uh, we do have a hand up. And great. And we'll get some more. Uh, first one is Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Hi, this is Nancy from Massachusetts. Um, well, there's a lot to think about uh, what you're saying. I read a book through one of my groups, and I forgot the first part of the book, but it's First Nations, First Genocide, something like that. It talks about the, the influence and the role of the church, of the first mm -hmm. comers. Mm -hmm. and how they utilize in order to any group that wants to subject another one has to vilify, demonize, diminish, and reduce to almost zero mentally, emotionally, before they can subject, subject a group of people. It's used in every avenue of life, and that's the beginning of that. The, the role of the church has a lot to do with what happened to the Native Americans or the tribal nations everywhere in the world. So that's the point I want to bring into the conversation, perhaps to study in a later future. But also, there's a combination of factors here. Uh, tribal nations never really felt that they owned the land. And that was the gate keeper, that was the gate door for the settlers and the invaders to think of taking their land. So it has to be somebody who thinks in a way for others to take in or to get a hold in your life. My question to you is this. If the tribal nations never had felt that they owned the land because they have other values in terms of they don't have a concept of ownership and selling something that they don't own, the settlers who are greedy, takers, overpowering, and are always in the me, me mentality, this is for me, this is for me, this is for me, of course they had a foothold to come and take the land from the tribal nations. My question to you is this, is there anything at the moment 
throughout the tribal nations to think of, rethink their values and start thinking that they own the land or they still are, if they don't start thinking in a different way, then they're giving away the right to something that they don't have. And so they can come and say, this is mine, because in the first okay. place... Um, Nancy, I think I understand your question. Um, so let me just move on with answering yes. it. If that's okay. Yes, please. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't know. From my perspective, like nobody owns the land. You know, we're we're all part of the earth. We're just animals here. Correct. And um, yeah, if you wouldn't mind muting yourself. Great. Um, and I, I, of course, I'm you know I'm here to learn just as much as you, and I have no right or desire to um, generalize millions of people and different tribes that existed here into one tribal nation. They all had different ideas about you know things, and I don't know every single one of their history and how they refer to where they lived or you know. But um, if your question is, are there strategies to um, to mitigate that? Um, I think that's uh, maybe that's a, that's something we can get to later. But you know, uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of indigenous groups that have been forming land trusts to gain back, regain back their ancestral homeland back into sort of like their community trust. So, and there's, I'm sure, other things going on. I'm not an expert and I don't want to generalize tribal people, you know, as a one monolithic whole, but I do know that there's a lot of efforts with land trusts these days and um, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing and it's something that maybe everybody here knows something about in your region and I certainly um, have resources in my region that I can share with you. Um, but is there any other question about um, problems with permaculture as I kind of laid it out in the concepts? Um, yeah, so Susan, uh, we have one more hand, uh, or two more hands up now, uh, but we also That's have a number one. two. And uh, I think that your your audio was getting a little bit more distorted towards the end there, so I don't know if you're okay, sorry about that. different. Okay. okay. Um, so yeah, next we had Justin Richardson. Uh, hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, hi. Um, thanks for this. This is a lot of good things to think about. Uh, I noticed a comment uh, in your response to the last um, question, and I liked it. It was said, you said, we are all just animals on the earth. And I like that sentiment. It's like, uh, it suggests that we're all in this together and we're sharing things. And it also raises in my mind a question about what is the definition of animals? And I guess to some extent, the earth. I mean, on one hand, we're, here we are talking about kind of cultural conflict in a, a human-centric manner, and that suggests that the you know non-human animals are kind of other, and they're maybe they're they're of the earth, but they're they're not human. And I, just as you go on, I, it would be helpful to me if you could talk about um, how we treat animals, um, and particularly because um, these days factory farming and animal agriculture is one of our great environmental problems. And of course, that wasn't a problem in um, indigenous cultures because it just, well, for one, maybe there weren't as many people, um, but there was just a natural kind of respect for the balance of things, and that included animals. And, you know, the, the notion that, I mean, you take what you need, but you don't take more than that. Um, so I'm having trouble just, this is a to topic I think about a lot. How do we reconcile? Um, where we came from uh, and our relationship to animals and the earth and where we are today. And I guess that's, hopefully that doesn't seem off topic, um, but that's what's on my mind. And if you have any comments about it, I appreciate it. Great. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, like to me, um, how, how folks tended the land that they're stewarding, right? Yes. Am I cutting uh, out? It's still, it's still sounding very distorted to me. Oh, okay. When did that start? Because I haven't changed anything. It started right after Nancy's question. 
Oh, okay. I wonder if that threw something off. Um, um, am I still sounding distorted? It's a little bit better. A little bit better. Okay. Oh, that sounds good. Okay, how about now? There's also some construction happening next door, so maybe that's disturbing things. How about now? And now. if I spoke a little louder? Yeah, I think when the volume goes up, it becomes more distorted. So it becomes more distorted? Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, aside from getting off the call and getting back on, I'm not sure how to solve this right now. So um, I think this is good enough then. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, we don't have that much more time left, so maybe let's just. I'll try to talk a little bit slower. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. Does that work? Awesome. Okay. Okay. Let's try that. Maybe I'll also try moving my phone to another. A different part of my desk. Um, so yeah, Justin, I mean, I think for me, like the way that our relationship to other creatures here is part of tending the land to me and tending sort of, you know, tending nature or like living in concert with nature. So yes, I do believe that things like factory farming are um, results of the industrial whatever, you know, ideas and milieu that came about here. And a lot of that had to do with the economic system that was, you know, started here. It was imported here of capitalism. So I think that is part of the conversation. But you know, I don't want to also go down that path because that is um, deserves a conversation of its own, I believe. So, but I I feel like that's all part of the, you know, how we tended the land or how we tended um, our our relationship with nature. I could even say, right, whether we it was one of symbiotic reverence and following the rhythms of nature, or it was sort of more like this Western thought where you know you saw things as being separated from each other. Therefore, it was easy to pluck out little pieces and sort of like you know, um, yeah, sort of like um, um, uh, um, monetize that piece, right? Which I think is part of factory farming's problem. But um, but anyways, let me, in the interest of time, I will just move on. And then at the end, hopefully, we can still have some Q&A to talk about some of these things. Um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is um, cultural appropriation versus appreciation, which, again, is um, follows everything that I've already talked about. And I know everybody has heard a lot about cultural appropriation by now. I feel like in the last three years, maybe three or four years, it's been a hot topic out there. Um, and cultural appropriation has been happening all along, but for some reason I feel like it's been a pretty hot topic like in pop culture, or pop media, and even mainstream media. And I think it's, um, it's, it's a good topic. I think it's a time, time topic that's ha you know, finally had its time right, to come out to the forefront. Um, and does everybody know what I mean when I say cultural appropriation? You can um, press 2. Press 2 to let me know if you know what I mean when I say cultural appropriation. So yeah, we got a little bit under 50%, so might be worth explaining. OK, great. So cultural appropriation is when you're mimicking aspects of someone else's culture, and it's taken out of context. So the thing that people were calling out a lot in the last maybe three years or something was things happening in festivals, things like Coachella, where um, young women wearing bikini were also wearing headdresses, Native American headdresses, as a mm. fashion thing. And taking it completely out of the context, first of all, like appropriating you know that thing, the sacred item, and taking it out of context because that's only for um, cheeks to wear after they have earned it, not for twenty year old you know drunken girls at a at a music festival, and then also like without you know any of the other things that I'm about to get into, so it's you know taking or mimicking aspects of someone else's culture. And using it in like a, a way that was not intended, right? Usually, usually wearing it in a way that is um, um, kind of like fetishizing or or tokenizing of the of that culture. 
Um, so there's, a, you know, and then people have have you know had really good discussions around. Well, you know, cultures have always been, you know, certain cultures, aspects of cultures have always been shared, and there's cultural sharing and cultural appro appreciation happening all the time. So what is the difference between cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation? And for me, I think it's a um, the same things that I've been talking about. Um, are there proper and genuine relationships built first with those cultures that you are mimicking or taking aspects from? Were there actual relationships built? Do you have any actual relationships with those cultures? Any at all before you know taking aspects of it, or is it just a um, just some kind of a fashionable prop that you're consuming? And was there equal reciprocity? given for you to, you know, kind of like mimic or take on aspects of that culture. And certainly, um, usually the, the phenomenon usually happens or is problematic when folks who are sort of, um, when there's a relationship between what's being taken and who's taking it, there's a historical relationship of the oppressor and the, you know, the colonized, right? So in the in the you know the example of um, indigenous culture, it's like okay, these people, their ancestors conquered these other people, and now they feel free to like you know steal aspects of their culture and you know um, use it in ways that it was is totally inappropriate and it's like mocking and you know wrong. So it kind of like has an underlying um, replication of um, dynamics of oppression and privilege. So in those cases. Like really thinking about like did your people make reparations for what happened to the people you're stealing this from? And it's just, you know, there's a lot of problematic aspects of it. It's not just like paying reciprocity, like, oh, like, you know, giving money to buy something. Where is there actual relationship and like understanding that there's reparations that need to be made before you can even appreciate that other culture's um culture's aspects of that other culture, right? <laughs> so let me just move on and then so that we can get to a Q and A. Um, and the things that to be wary of in these topics, because you know, for folks who maybe haven't thought about these topics very much, or you know, is kind of kind of like had a different kind of mindset or wasn't thinking about, um, it's easy to be, to be get really like defensive about this or deflective because you know someone is sort of like calling out or questioning the way that you've been doing things. And I'm saying you as a general whomever is out there, not anyone specific here. Um, but some of the things to be wary of is, and that I've heard when I give this talk, there's been people who have said this to me, and I've had to like come up with some like you know cogent argument um, to um, to sort of like you know deconstruct it. And one thing, one comment that I hear a lot is some aspect of this that like, oh, we're just one race, one people. We should be all working together and united together peacefully. Why are you, you know, mentioning these things to divide us? And the folks who usually ask that are people who, um, who experience sort of like societal privilege. Everybody who's ever said that or um, mentioned that to me has been a white male. Um, and problematic thing is that I think there's just like not a recognition of the things that I'm saying. I'm not just like making up just to like, you know, cause problems. These are like things that like people of color, people, you know, indigenous folks, they they have they these are like the real complaints, right, that they have about aspects of like the resiliency movement or the dominant culture. These are real pains for people. And to say that, oh, we're just all one people, one race, we shouldn't be talking about this, is like, you know, pretty dismissive of people's experiences and the harms that people feel and the, you know, the, the real, like, pains that people feel and the real, like, oppression and marginalization that people experience in their real world day-to-day -day lives. Um, and I think before we can get to any kind of like everybody peacefully working together and united together as one race, one people, like we need to address the harms first. We need to do a lot of healing. We need to make reparations. We need to do, you know, a lot of, you know, honest conversations and and forgiving and apologizing. So I feel like that whole general notion is pretty dismissive of actual people's experiences. Uh, and then the other thing to be, I guess, wary of when people are usually 
uh, feeling defensive or deflective about like you know social justice topics or like um, identity stuff is you know they get they those people often get called out for like check your privilege you know I'm sure some of you have heard that term and it's like sometimes like people are like what does check your privilege mean really um, it seems like you know not very specific about like what that means. And I think one thing, one great description I've come across recently is to check feelings of rightfulness, like um, or an entitlement. Entitlement, I think, is a little bit harsher version of rightfulness, right? If you feel like you have a right to something, and someone's saying no, you don't, and you feel defensive, you know, check for like your feelings of rightfulness. Does that come from a privilege? You know, having been um, given, having you know, having received some privilege from the dominant culture. And then now you feel like it's yours, and why should you know you have to give it away? Like you know, if for instance, if we're talking about land, or um, there's another incident that I come across recently um, is a there's a herbal teacher here in the North Bay, or not in the North Bay, in Northern California. He's in the North Bay, I'm not. <laughs> and he's been questioned a lot. He's he's done some things that um, seem like he's taking exactly what I'm talking about, like technologies that are indigenous to um to to you know native folks in this area and then sort of you know having classes around it and uh, you know making income of course you know he's an herbal teacher he's not making a lot of income but he's still making you know commodifying it to to a degree and then he's been questioned by some indigenous folks especially like indigenous folks in the areas that he was teaching these workshops like hey where did you learn that from who gave you permission to teach it like who you know and they were just general genuine questions. There was no initial attacking him. And you know, and the guy's a white male and he got very irate and defensive and started um telling some of the indigenous folks calling him out that they were messed up, that they had wrong ideas in their head and that when he teaches this workshops, indigenous people come and are grateful to him for giving them knowledge. So I feel like um there's just like a lot of defensiveness that came from like, you know, a right to something, an entitlement. And when that was questioned, he got, you know, he got very um, obstinate, I guess. <coughs> so um, there's other things to be kind of, I guess, probably wary about that I come across a lot. Um, but I'll just leave that there. And I guess um, one thing, maybe a question. Um, I mean, I guess maybe I'll just wrap up by saying, you know, the ways to practice decolonization and move towards right relations really is to sort of like build those relationships to folks who are displaced, either on the land that you live on or other folks, other groups of folks who are um, displaced or oppressed or marginalized by the very systems that maybe some of us, you know, receive privilege from. Or maybe we don't receive privilege, but we just want to be in solidarity with them, you know. And to have those right kinds of relationships, ask first, um, make re you know, give reciprocity, make reparations, um, you know, support and be in solidarity with Indigenous folks, especially who whose you know ancestral home it is that you live on and you call home, and that these people very much they're not extinct, they're not in the past, they weren't some like you know. Um, they're not the you know their current manifestation is not you know some whatever you know deer skin wearing you know native person like you know hunting whatever it is that they are you know they're here they're modern folks and they're part of probably still your you know, the communities that you live in but they you know been displaced from their ancestral land they've been um, disenfranchised, they've been marginalized, you know, and they struggle, they have real struggles, especially with trying to regain their land, right, regain their ancestral land, retain their land, and retain their sovereignty and their culture with everything that they're faced against in a settler colonial society. Um, so with that, why don't I open it up to Q&A, and in particular, um, if you're with transition movement, and I haven't, you know, probably addressed things that are maybe more specific to transition movement, I would love to hear about it. And whatever else you have any questions or comments around, let's just open it up by pressing one. Okay. 
So we got a couple hands up already. Uh, first is Ken Rawls. Hi, um, Ken Rawls in Sausalito, California. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking that mimicking is one of the highest forms of flattery. Um, personally, I value the skills Native Americans possess and would like to practice them myself in order to improve. But being outside the Native American community where I don't know any indigenous people, how can I develop relationships or perform reciprocity? Yeah, great question. Um, I mean, just everything I said, build relationships. And I know you're yeah, saying, well, like, well, how do, well, I, how do, I, how do I even need them to build relationships, right? So if you look up the people whose land you're on, they're still Alone. around there. They may be even displaced. I'm sorry? Alone. Are you in Ohlone territory? Yes, yeah, so I can okay. give you specific things. So, um, so most of the most, uh, almost every indigenous community I know is like struggling and they're organizing around something. Usually has to do with like fighting for their ancestral land. Look it up. Do the research. Look it up. Show up. Show up to events that they're having. Show up and make connections. Keep showing up. At first, they're not going to like, you know, like say hi to you or welcome you because like who are you, right? Keep showing up, keep supporting, make relationships. It's going to take time. It's going to make a lot of, you know, take a lot of effort on your part. Show up, make relationships, and then start asking. Okay, thank you. Okay. So we have somebody else that uh, hit two on their keypad. I'm not sure exactly what that's about. But, yeah, uh, am I still have... pretty fuzzy? Uh, it's gotten a lot better. Okay, great. Um, uh, we had two uh, hands up, Christina Zill and then Michael Albert, and then we're probably going to have to start wrapping up. Okay. Hi, Susan. Yes. Thanks for this wonderful presentation. Um, I recently went to the Farmer's Museum in Cooperstown, New York. I live in the Catskill Mountains in upstate New York which definitely used to be settled by Native Americans. And so there was a display of an old apothecary, and I was watching the guy making ginger pills. And I said, ginger? Ginger wouldn't grow around here. And he said, no, the settlers brought all of their, of their stuff from Europe. They brought all the things that they had been importing from elsewhere and for years that was their medicine so it seemed worse to me that the settlers didn't come and and ask the native people what do you know so how do you reconcile that i mean in other words if they had looked around and said what do you know and had started using those herbs, then it would be cultural appropriation. But it seems worse in a way to just import everything and impose it on, you know, I mean, without, without looking to the wisdom that was there. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do. And I think, um, I think that's not a cultural appropriation. That's like exactly doing the right thing, right? Asking, not coming and imposing your own view, but asking, coming to uh, an existing community and asking, like, hey, what do you do here, right? That's right. very humbling, you know, humbling yourself. I think that's, like, very much trying to build relationships, actually. Um, right, which is exactly but, what they didn't do. But, but now, like, the, the guy who was doing the presentation is totally into natural medicine and herbs and so on. So would you say that that's cultural appropriation that he's doing now? Who was the person again? Um, he was a he was a white guy who was um, he was an actor. You know, um, he was basically playing the part of an apothecary. But we we got him involved in a conversation, and we he took us on a tour of his natural uh, medicinal garden. And you know, he had learned all of the natural herbs that grow in the area. So even though from, he was making a presentation like a about what had happened before. Pardon? Yeah, and it was at a, um, an, some kind of a native museum, you said? No, no, it was a farmer's museum. Oh, so it was oh. about the settlers. Um, 
Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the context is. I don't really fully understand what the context is, so okay, sorry. it's kind of hard to say. Right. If it was right. that, like a, um, if he was saying that, oh, I learned this from native teachers. Obviously, that would be, you know, maybe wrong and problematic. But yeah, I'm not sure. Sorry, I don't really okay. quite understand what the context is. Okay, I just, I guess, I was just saying that it seems like it's much worse to bring something and impose it on an area than it is to just say, "What do you already know? What can we learn from you?" Right, I see what you're saying. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, culture and like development of culture and um, is so complex. I think it's sort of hard to make a judgment call, like a definitive judgment call. Right. Um, I think there's like you know things that are more easily easy to judge, or like things that are pretty obviously aspects aspects of another culture's you know an aspect of another culture that's pretty obvious, and that's being used in a um, um, a way that's not appropriate. I think that's kind of easier to say, like, oh, that's cultural appropriation, or like that's problematic. But you know, right. Anyway, thank you. I'll let you move on to the next. Okay, question. thank you. Okay, so I think we only have time for one more question, unfortunately. But uh, fortunately, we'll have Susan back in a, a couple weeks for another teleseminar. Um, so we'll go last to Michael <laughs> Albert, who I know who has had his hand up before. Michael. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Cool. Uh, thank you very much for the seminar. Really interesting and informative. Uh, so I just have like two simple questions. So first, I'm wondering if you think on if you think that the concept of permaculture is itself kind of problematic, like. Do you think that, I mean, on one hand, do you think it's potentially useful to kind of come up with this concept permaculture to kind of like, you know, bring all, to like synthesize all these various techniques to use in a modern context as long as it gives proper recognition to all these various cultures that it draws from? Or do you think that it is problematic to brand it in such a way rather than like just calling it indigenous techniques. So I'm just curious if you think the term permaculture itself is problematic or you think it's fine as long as, you know, there is due recognition and relationship still with the, you know, the groups where these techniques are taken from. And then just the second question, very simple. I'm just wondering if you know of any transition initiatives that have, you know, built effective relationships with, uh, with Native peoples in the way that you have uh, discussed they should. Um, yeah, so yeah, I mean, thank you for your question. I think it's it's pretty complex, right? Because it's like permaculture. Um, I personally think that the term is a little bit problematic just because of the way that it's been used um, and that it's a brand, you know, that that is, you know, commodified. Um, I still use it just because it's such a widely used term and it's sort of hard to, you know, I'm part of the communities of folks who practice that, right, community, um, uh, a community of practitioners, right? And it's it's kind of like hard to get away from it because it's like there's not another term that I can just like easily insert and have everybody know what I'm talking about. So I do use it. Sometimes I I put quotes around it, and at least the folks that I'm in relations with know that this is the kind of work that I do, so they know that I'm using it very carefully. Um, there is, and that's one of the things that's actually on your sheet, and you know I will send you more. Um, more um, information on, and because like this term is like already exists and it's widely used, um, I think there have been folks, and I've been one of the people who've been like you know intentionally trying to decolonize the, the at least the community and the movement itself. And we came up with a document called "35 Plus Things to Create More Inclusion and Diversity at Your Permaculture Event" last year, and then folks who were gathered at the North America Permaculture Convergence in 2014 had come up with a, um, a list of uh, requests, which are really interesting to read through. And I feel like, you know, to 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 make this movement to like more um, evolve to to you know to include social justice, that these are like good places, um, good work that people have been doing, and good places to follow. And hopefully, things are evolving and changing constantly. Um, 
So I, I personally um, feel I'm always careful about how I use that term. And of course, you know, it's everybody. It's up to everybody what their comfort level is and and what their understanding about um, you know the problems behind it is. I think for me, like. I'm not sure if there's another word that's easily um, insertable. I also know that people use that term permaculture in a lot of variety of ways, and it's not really the you know the actual. Some people use it in a way that's not the actual definition of permaculture. You know, some people just use it to mean like sustainable gardening. So yeah, I don't know. You know, language and terms are just kind of like such complex, weird entities. But yeah, so I use it very carefully, and I just am more interested in in um, Making sure that maybe like folks understand some of the more problematic aspects behind it, rather than like giving up or not giving up the term or being part of or not being part of that movement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as far as um, folks working, I'm I'm not part of transition, so I don't really know. I know that there's a um, at least in my area, um, there's someone in Mendocino County doing some work, and I think he's part of transition, but he could just be part of permaculture, so I'm not really sure. Maybe Don knows, or I bet um, Carolyn, who's not on this call, who's a co one of the co-directors of transition, she would probably know a lot about that. Yeah, so I'll just uh, make a few comments about that really briefly. Uh, there are a number of transition groups that are working particularly to build bridges with indigenous communities where they are. Uh, I know that Transition Humboldt is one of them uh, that's been really focused on that. Um, they've done um, Skillshare events uh, bringing together both transition folks and people from indigenous communities to share skills uh, with the world. That's, that's Larry? Yep. Larry is that Larry? Larry. Okay. Yep, Redwood Larry. Um, so he's doing good work around that, but there's a, a number of other groups that are doing that. And uh, Jewel Bestrova, who gave the last uh, teleseminar last week uh, on inner resilience and self-care, uh, she spent a lot of time out at Standing Rock uh, over the last year or two and built relationships out there and uh, ended up inviting um, Phyllis Young and Pearl Means to give one of the keynote uh, addresses at our Transition National Gathering this summer. And they said something that was really poignant for me, which was that this was the first national conference that they had ever been invited to speak at. Um, and they were really appreciative of that. And I thought, wow, that's, a, that's amazing because these women have been involved in environmental work for decades. Uh, doing some really groundbreaking work, and uh, this was the first time that they were invited to speak at a national conference. But there, there are a lot of. This is an uh, issue that's really up in the transition movement right now, and so I'm really glad that we had a little time uh, this afternoon, this evening, uh, to have this conversation. And I know we're going to be continuing this conversation. Uh, on November 2nd, uh, Susan is going to be doing another teleseminar on creating inclusive and diverse communities. And I wonder if you just take a minute, Susan, to tell everybody a little bit about what the focus is going to be there going forward and any other closing comments you have. And then I just have uh, one or two announcements before we wrap. Yeah, um, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Um, I guess that one will be, you know, will be a con continuation of this conversation. Some of the concepts will be same because, you know, the concepts I'm trying to drive home are this like building relationships, making reciprocity, you know, all this stuff. I think the the focus of that conversation will be more like the second part of this, which is like how to move forward. Um, maybe maybe not move forward making reparations for just to indigenous communities, but to create more, you know inclusion in the, the work that you do. So it will be a little bit more like how to move forward, create, you know, more, more um, around solutions, creating solutions. Um, and my last comment is thank you so much for everybody for being here. And unfortunately, like, I don't get to see each of you. So I know there's a wide variety of perspective and um, knowledge and experience in this realm certainly out there. And um, feel free. I will be following up this thing. 
with an updated version of the guide that I sent with um, more uh, resources listed that I'll be sending through Transition US that you should all receive. And I hope that you catch my other talk. And my email address is on there, so if you ever want to connect with me um, about anything, feel, please feel free to connect with me. Great. Well, thank you so much uh, for your time here, Susan, and for your comments. Uh, yes, thank you all very much for coming.